好，谢谢。This was supposed to be the year that China's economy came roaring back. What we've had instead are signs that this economy is struggling. 就确实消费比以前少一些了。现在老百姓都挺穷的，没有钱。Faltering growth, soaring youth unemployment rates, an economy on the brink of deflation. After decades of a stunning economic rise, China's challenges are mounting. So, what's going on with the 18 trillion dollar economy, and why does it matter to the rest of the world? There were COVID restrictions all across the country. When those restrictions ended, everyone expected consumers would come back and spend, factories would start making product again, and China would once again be the global motor for growth. China's economy losing further momentum. Okay, they are、There、out, and oh, wow,、oh, ooh, oh, not good. All right. China slowing down, of course, affects Asia, affects the world. When we talk about why the economy is slowing now, there's three things I would point to. One, there's a problem with the real estate market here. The government identified that there was a bubble in property about two or three years ago and started to take steps to try and deflate that bubble. For decades, China's booming property market has meant that owning a property is a surefire way of increasing your personal wealth. The problem was the crackdown on the property sector, cracking down on how much debt it had, happened very intensively and far faster than the economy could really catch up with.、Uh, what's happened as a result, though, is now in 2023, you've seen a very dramatic, in some places, drop in home prices. 就是买什么都跌，房产也也不知道能不能增值。就是想把自己手里所有的房子一个都不留，都卖掉。That leads to the second point I would make, which is about confidence. When those home prices fall, even if people are not earning less in terms of salary, they are feeling poor. At the beginning of the year, as China reopened its borders, we were expecting to see a big flood of consumer spending, what we call revenge spending, and we did see that happen for quite some time, at least the first few months of the year.、But、now, what's happening is that we're seeing that consumer spending start to drop off, and one of the reasons why is because we're seeing people save their money rather than spend it. The third thing I would point to is debt. 10, 15 years ago, when the economy slowed, the government had a very good playbook: was to borrow at the local level and build more roads, more ports, more airports, more infrastructure. That would lead to more demand for things like cement and steel. But now, today, there's way too much debt at the local level already, and so the government is looking for new ways to get the economy going again. How did China become the world's second-largest economy? It all goes back to 1978. That's when Deng Xiaoping was in charge. Today, he's known as the architect of modern China for the major reforms he pushed through. But even he might be surprised by the scale of change unleashed by opening up to trade and investment. China kickstarted a 45-year transformation that took it from a largely agricultural society to the economic powerhouse we know today. So even though there's a lot of concern about growth here in China, I think it's important to remember that the economy is still growing. In the first half, the economy grew 5.5 percent, and most economists are still expecting China's GDP to increase by about 5 percent in 2023. For any other country, they would be ecstatic by a growth pace of that speed. But here in China, the problem is relative to the past. Now I've been a journalist here in China since 2003, and back then, regularly the economy was growing 10%, 11%, 12%. In the second quarter of 2007, the economy here grew 15%, and so relative to that, it feels much slower now. 我国经济长期向好的基本面没有变，对高质量发展要有坚定的信心。The major problem here is that、uh, you know China's moving off its old economic growth model, but it hasn't moved comfortably into what's next. China's economic model has been incredibly successful at providing low-cost goods to the West. That's lifted hundreds of millions of people within China out of poverty, and the model continues to do that. But what it seems to be struggling with now is getting past that middle-income trap. A lot of this infrastructure investment, in particular, has led to a lot of overcapacity, and it's led a lot of these local governments to take on debt、uh, that they haven't really been able to figure out a way out of right now. 
Restoring confidence is key. Businesses have been battered by years of pandemic controls and crackdowns that Beijing is now struggling to unwind in a bid to bolster growth. The first sign of trouble came in China's tech sector in November 2020. All we know so far, China has suspended both the Shanghai and the Hong Kong IPOs. Fintech giant Ant Group, a unit of billionaire Jack Ma's empire, was gearing up for what was set to be the world's biggest IPO. But just days before going public, Chinese authorities pulled the plug. That started a chain of events that shook the markets. These were unprecedented, sweeping clampdowns on the private sector, everything from property and education, as well as technology. That wiped out billions in market value for many companies, as well as the wealth of certain billionaires too. To reassure investors, Beijing has been sending the message that it's back open for business with the world. Rolling out the red carpet for the likes of JP Morgan's Jamie Dimon and Elon Musk after years of a tough operating environment under Xi Jinping. But the Chinese government knows that getting the private sector back up and running is really critical if it wants to restore growth in the economy. Challenges on the diplomatic front, especially between China and its great rival, the U.S., have also made investors wary, clouding the economic outlook. Despite U.S. officials flying to Beijing in recent months to reset trust in ties, the two superpowers remain at odds over issues ranging from Taiwan to access to high-end tech. Already we're seeing a move to, the U.S. would say, de-risk from Chinese supply chain. There is an increased move among Western multinationals to try and address that by buying more of their goods from places like uh, India or uh, countries in Southeast Asia. But if the relationship with the West is going to cut China off from some of these key uh, new technologies, that's going to be trouble in the long run. The U.S. and China are the world's two biggest economies. The value of the trade of goods between them surpassed $690 billion in 2022. I think the Chinese are concerned about uh, sluggish growth in their economy. So that relationship between the U.S. and China whether it be trade, manufacturing, you name it, has been hugely beneficial for both economies, and it has huge spillover effects for the rest of the global economy. China is hugely important to the world because it is such an important end consumer for products, especially in the commodities and energy world. So if China's economy is not going to recover the way that the world had hoped, it's going to mean other countries, they're going to find it harder to find markets where they can sell their goods and services to. In a connected world where we live, that's going to have a ripple effect across the globe.